Um, you know, I made that joke, but it's true. You know, uh, I was talking in Sunday school. I have never uh, preached through Romans before, and so I certainly never preached on submitting to government before because that is not within my flesh. That's not like, oh, like I'm going to preach that sermon. Um, I never had preached before about uh, secondary matters and how we're to agree to disagree. As y'all know, as I told y'all, you know, I got caught up in some legalism years back, and so. Um, I praise God where I am today and how God brought me through that, but that was not an easy sermon. And, and then we, we continue and we keep seeing how God wants all of us to come together around the gospel, around the mission of the word. And that is to preach the word. That is to live out the word. That is to see people meet Jesus. And for those who say, you know what, I don't want them, that's okay. But that doesn't mean that we should divide about all our differences. So I got a few questions for you. Why is it that we in our flesh, at times, we want to badmouth other local churches and denominations? Why is that within us? Or, or what, it, what about this? Why is it that on social media and on, on YouTube and other places we see this so often? Where the, the, these people are badmouthing their convention or badmouthing other conventions and, and badmouthing this denomination, badmouthing this denomination, badmouthing this church. You know, this church, they have screens and the preacher's on the screen and they're not a real church. And this church, they don't have screens and, and all they do is just out of a, a hymnal and there's no technology and so they're not a real church. Or, you know, that church, they have technology and so they're not a real church. And there's just all of this division, all of this just ugliness within churches and within denominations. Why is it? What if God wanted us, despite our differences, to unite around the two things I shared with you two weeks ago? Biblical morality and the gospel. Salvation. And then all the other things we can agree to disagree. Do you think the church, the big C church in this world, do you think we would be a lot more effective at reaching the lost if that was the case? I do. And no, I told y'all, like, I've had to come out of that legalism myself. And so I can tell you why. Because we love to point out the faults in others. We love to point out the perceived faults, faults in others, don't we? we? We look and we say, well, that's wrong. If they did that different, then I don't like that. And so what we do is we build what we think things should be, and that we anything that's not what we think, we just we, we call them heretics, or we call them not churches, or blasphemers, right? But what does that make us sound like when we read the Bible? Pharisees and Sadducees. You know, I think it's funny that the, the Sadducees begins with sad. I'm just saying. <laughs> because the truth is, is that we behave very sad, and, and, and we're honestly just kind of showing our hearts. Because can we really be super close to the Lord and yet have that kind of heart? No. And again, I'm speaking from experience. I've been there, I've done that. Charles Hodge uh, was a professor and a theologian in the 1800s, and he said the following. The church is everywhere represented as one. It is one body, one family, one fold, one kingdom. It is one because pervaded by one spirit, we are all baptized into one spirit, so as to become, says the apostle, one body. Now, do we have local churches? Yes. But is there one big C church according to the word? Yes. And just because they do things differently, just because they sing different kinds of music, just because they have a few different beliefs than we have, does not mean that they are not one of us and that we are not one of them. Amen? Amen. We've got to make sure that we, as the body, are not creating division and hurting the gospel as we do. The question, the title that I want to answer is this. Can local churches with different practices remain united in Jesus Christ? Is it possible? Can we turn this thing around? Well, if I would tell you, if, if the answer is yes, where does it begin? Does it begin with those churches out there, or does it begin with this church in here? Right here. 
It begins not just with this church in here, but it begins with those who are sitting in the pews right now, those that are watching online. It begins within you and within me. Because when we get it right, and when we're focusing on the gospel and realizing that we need to be united and not be tearing down our brothers and sisters in Christ for differences, then what happens is, is that others will see that and they'll see the blessing of God that comes when we get it right. The main point that I have for you today, and it's on your screen, if you have a listening guide, um, the word is stronger, that would be in your uh, blank. Local churches are stronger together than they are apart when they choose to love and support one another despite their secondary differences. I, I just want to remind you again, despite their secondary differences, not despite their differences, their secondary differences, we must always agree on biblical morality. We must always agree on what the Bible says is sin is sin. Then secondly, we must always agree on salvation. As a matter of fact, as we're about to read this passage, as we're coming to an end of the book of Romans, I will tell you that was the whole first eight, nine chapters of Romans was, let me unpack salvation for you. Because he did not want us to be confused about this thing. It's important that we understand salvation, and it's important that we understand biblical morality, and that everything else, it's okay to agree to disagree. Not just within this body, but within other bodies as well. So I invite you to open up your Bibles to Romans chapter 15, uh, verse 14, and as you're doing that, um, the word will be up on the screen when the time is to read it. But what I want to remind you is, is that this message is for you. Um, some of you, uh, your marriages are doing really, really well, and they haven't been, but they are. They've been growing. Some of you, your marriages aren't doing so hot. Some of you, you're missing uh, your, your, your spouse. You've been widowed. Um, some of you, it, you're just here on vacation. Some of you, 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 you have had a horrible week at work. Some of you, you've had a horrible week in the home. Whatever has been going on in your life, God knew it before it was going to happen, and he prepared this message for your heart. For you and for me. And so Romans chapter 15, I invite you all to stand as we read uh, and honor the word of God. And, and as many congregations do today and have throughout uh, many, many, uh, thousands, throughout thousands of years. And so Romans chapter 15, verse number 14 says, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. But on some points I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my word for God, for I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. And thus, I make it my ambition to preach the gospel. Not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. This is the reason why I have so often been hindered from coming to you. But now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain, and to be helped on my journey there by you once I have enjoyed your company for a while. At present, however, I am going to Jerusalem, bringing aid to the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints of Jerusalem. For they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessing, they ought also to be of service to them in material blessings. When therefore I have completed this and have delivered to them what has been collected, I will leave for Spain by way of you. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. I appeal to you, 
brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ, and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. That is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the book of Romans as we come to a head, as we have one last chapter next week, Lord. God, I pray that we appreciate this book for what it is. I pray that as we, we read this passage, that we see the, so much of the blessing of Paul's ministry and, and the burden that you put on Paul, Lord, put that burden on us. Unite us around sharing the gospel, preaching the gospel, but also partnering with other churches and denominations and believers in doing so. Lord, let it be all for your glory and not for our own. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, Amen. 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 So, as I mentioned to you, this, this is a diverse group of believers. This is Romans and Gentiles, which means not Roman, not Jew, and, and so specifically from other areas they've been, they've been brought into Rome. And then you also have these Jews, and all of them have converted to Christianity. And, and you know, some of them, they, they were raised on one side of the street, the others were raised on the other side of the street. Some of them were raised in the uptown, some of them were raised in the low town. Some of them were raised speaking this language, the others were raised speaking this language. They were all raised with different beliefs, and over the time in their lives, they developed different practices and different things. And so these churches, because remember, the book of Romans wasn't written to one church, it was written to many churches that would have been house churches most likely in Rome. And so they have all this diversity. And, and, and so Paul wants to make sure you may be diverse, but you can't be diverse on the gospel. And, and then afterwards, uh, he, he talks to the Jews because the Jews are going, why are things the way they are? We, we were the people. We were God's chosen people. But now all these Gentiles are coming into our churches. All these Gentiles are claiming Christ as their own. And, and so Paul, through 9, 10, and 11, says there's hope that in the end, speaking in my opinion of at the end times, that what you'll see during the tribulation, you'll see the Jews, you'll see a great revival coming in. And so then you had chapter 12, and chapter 12 was a beautiful chapter saying, this is what it looks like to, to be on fire for the Lord. This is what it looks like to love Jesus. This is what it looks like to walk in the Spirit. And then, as I mentioned, we had chapter 13, which was um, to be a good godly citizen when it comes to government and, and other uh, citizens in our, in our community. And then last, the two weeks ago, again, that we're to be united around Jesus, united around morality, that we're allowed to have differences, even if we're right. That's one of the things that the Lord really hit me with two weeks ago. Even if we're right. Like, do I read the Bible and see that baptism is by immersion and that there's like no reason to say otherwise? Yes! But do I have to convince other denominations and other churches and Christians to believe and, and to live the way I do? No! Do I look at the end times and the revelation and I read it as is and I'm like, this just makes so much sense when you just read it as is. And they have their differences and do I just say, you've got to believe the way I believe? No! How many of you are stubborn? Come on now. How many of you are stubborn? Yes. People aren't going to stubborn you into believing the way they believe. But we love to try, don't we? We love to make that our mission. We love to make it our mission that you're going to believe everything I believe about tongues. You're going to believe everything I believe about deacons. You're going to believe everything I believe about the church. You're going to believe everything I believe. Why? Because I'm right and you're wrong. But is that the heart of Jesus? Because let me ask you this question. You may be right, but how long did it take you to get to the point where you are today? What if people were trying to shove it down your throat? I know how stubborn I am. I would be a lot less likely to receive it. And that is what Paul wanted to make sure was not going on in Roman churches. And so he gives this beautiful explanation about his life as he's desiring to go to Rome. But he has some business to do. So the first point today is many local church families are doing better 
than they and others might think. Many local church families are doing better than they and others might think. So if you have your listening guide, uh, better is the word. And so verse 14, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct them. You see, what's been happening is, is that Paul has laid out salvation, laid out all these things I just shared with you, and so he stops and he pauses and he says, not all of you are doing so bad, and most of you are doing better than you think you are. Do you need that sometimes? I'm my own worst enemy. How many of you like to just doubt yourself and you love to put yourself down? You love to see the faults in yourself. That's, that's me. That's me in a nutshell. And so what, what Paul says is, is, I'm satisfied about you, that you're full of goodness, you're filled with knowledge, you're able to instruct one another, you're doing better than you think you are. Are there times when you read the Bible and you just, you, just, you read it and you go, ooh, well, I'm not doing as hot as I thought I was, right? But then there are other times where you read it and you're just like, I'm a mess. It takes us time to get to where we need to be. And the truth is, None of you are where you need to be, including me. But we should be heading in that direction. Amen? Yes. We should be heading in that direction. But the thing is, is that so many Christians, they want to write blogs and posts on social media and, and videos. And they just want to, they want to tear everything down. They want to, they want to demean everything. That, that, that is their spiritual gift is to tell everybody why everybody else is wrong. How much good does that really do for the kingdom of God? I would say not so much. Not so much. And he also, in my opinion, outlines what should be present in our local churches. He says, full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able to instruct one another. How churches should be growing in goodness. You and I should be growing in goodness. We should be growing in Christ's likeness. I preached a series on this recently, holiness. But not just in goodness, not just in holiness, not just in righteousness. We should be growing in the knowledge of the Word of God. We should be growing in confidence as we read this book and going, I understand this a lot better now. I, I, I need this. Before I go talk to my husband, before I talk to my wife, I need to hear what the Lord has to say to me this morning. Amen? Before I go and deal with my children, before I go to work, before I go to school, before I go wherever I'm going today, before I open up Facebook or whatever it is, I need this. I need to grow in the knowledge of this. But not just in the knowledge, but notice what else it said. Again, the, the instructing one another. We should be growing and instructing one another in the Word. And that doesn't mean you've got to see things the way I see them. It means here's what the Word says. Let's talk about this and let's do life together. Amen? That's what the church should be. Number two, no local church family or denomination is perfect. Amen? The Southern Baptist Convention is not perfect. And no other denomination, no other convention, no other church is either. All need loving reminders to stay on the straight and the narrow path of faithfulness. Verse 15 says, But on some points I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. There are many passages in the Word, this one included, that makes it clear that every local church and denomination that we should be striving to be above reproach and that we should be open to accountability. There should be no church that says, you can't hold me accountable. There should be no denomination, no convention that should say, you can't hold me accountable. That's not allowed. There should be no Christian that should say, no, 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 I don't accept accountability. We all need accountability because without accountability, we will lose our way as we walk with Jesus. I promise you that. The Roman churches were encouraged to be open to accountability. They were to be open to correction. 
He says, yeah, Lord, there's goodness, there's this, there's this. However, some of these things needed to be said because I've heard what's been going on. I heard about the divisiveness. I heard about some of the things that you were rattling into your churches. And so some of these things needed to be said, and they needed to be said in boldness. One of the things I pray that you will receive, and, and I don't want you to receive a James as your next pastor, but what I do pray that you will receive is a pastor who has no problem speaking the word of God boldly to you and not worrying whether you like it or not. Amen. That is something God has really, really hammered me in as I've been here, as he's reminded me that I'm not here and that Paul wasn't there to have everybody like what he has to say, or even like him, that he was there to be faithful to the word and to hold the people to the word and to say, let's do this thing. Number three, local churches and denominations must remain humble as they strive to stay on task. Making sure the message of Jesus is preached to the unreached people of this world. Pride is so easy to fall into, is it not? Because the thing is, is that when we're down, we know we're down, don't we? But the thing is, is that when we're up, we see everybody being down, don't we? And we start going, oh man, I'm doing way better than he is doing. I'm doing way better than she's doing. I used to be there, but I ain't there anymore, right? And we hold people to a standard that we would never want anyone to hold us to. And we fall into pride. We follow the pride. Verses 17 through 21. In Christ Jesus, then, I have a reason. And who, by the way? And who? I want to hear this. Who? Christ Jesus. That is what we hold to. That is the tie that holds us together, that binds us together. In Christ Jesus, then, I have a reason to be proud of my work for God. Now, if you just read that verse, you're going to see the boast in yourself. No, 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 let's keep reading because we don't take verses out of context. Verse 18, for I will not venture to speak of anything, say anything, except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. And thus, I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. Let me remind you what Romans 15, 1 through 13 was. It was a reminder to the Jews and a let you know to the Gentiles that this was promised in the Old Testament, which at that time was the only testament. That, that the Gentiles was always going to happen. Non-Jews coming around the Lord and worshiping was always going to happen. And Paul was someone who was perfect to speak into that. Because he was a Roman citizen, but he was also raised Jewish. And he had a way of connecting both parties. He was the perfect person for God to use to write this letter and so when we're looking into this, Paul is saying, yes, I have reason to be proud of my work, but it's for God, it's not for me, and I'm not boasting in me, I'm boasting in what God has done in me, and I'm boasting in the call that God has put upon me. Church, boast in your call, not in your works. Look at me here. This is where Satan gets us. Well, we had so many baptisms, and they had more baptisms, and so since they had more baptisms, they must be better than that they, they have that music, and we've got this music, and they have this many people, and they have this many people, and they have this, and they have that. And we start comparing and contrasting. And does that go well in our walk with Christ? No, it never does. What we are to do is boast in the calling that God has put upon us, but not to boast in our works. Paul was boasting in his calling because he was literally bringing the message of Christ Anywhere and everywhere. And he ran out of places to do it. That's a pretty good thing, isn't it? He ran out of places. And so what he was saying is, is you know what? I want to go to Spain. Because those people haven't heard about Jesus yet. That's amazing. His heart for the Lord 
it was contagious. And that's why it spread. Church, your heart has to stay humble. And humble isn't just thinking less of yourself, it's thinking more of God. Never forget that. Number four, local churches and denominations must work together in order to be most effective at spreading the good news of Jesus to the world. We have to do this thing together. And then what we've got to do when we serve together, I've talked to missionaries. Um, any of y'all ever met a missionary or been a missionary? Okay. I've talked to missionaries, because y'all know I'm a curious person. Uh, right. Curious George, that was, that was written by me, it's Curious James. Okay. And so, as I've talked to them, I'll ask, what do you do when you're serving together and yet you believe this about baptism and you believe this and, and, and then this person believes this and this person believes this and y'all are serving in the mission field together. What do you do? And they said the same thing each time. This has been about three or four different conversations with different people that I've had. And they always come to say the same thing. We have to allow the people we're speaking to to come to the belief on their own on where they stand. Otherwise, we will get so bogged down on that that we muddy up the gospel of Jesus Christ. The word of God is sufficient. Say sufficient. Sufficient. It is sufficient. It is everything you need it to be in this song. You say, what do you mean by that? Here's what I mean by that. One of my favorite ways to witness to people is that when I'm witnessing to them, I'm having them read the Word of God out loud. I'm not telling them what the Bible says. I say, would you mind reading this for me? Why? Because the Word of God and the Spirit of God is plenty sufficient at bringing people to God and then those who know the Lord at bringing them to where He wants them to be. I've shared this with you many times. One of the things that Allison and I both had to learn early on in our marriage is that we cannot behave as the Holy Spirit for one another. We're too stubborn for that. She's too stubborn for that, and I'm too stubborn for that. And so we would buck one another and go like, you're not the Holy Spirit for me, and I'm not the, and we would just back and forth on that until finally what we realized is, is we just need to pray because the same Holy Spirit that's in her is in me. And, and that I just, you know, lovingly, I'll come to her and I'll say, hey, um, you know, this is the passage I'm thinking about. This is what I see going on. And then I just got to let the Holy Spirit learn. And then she's got to do the same in me. And so it's okay to go to, to your other brethren and sisters who disagree with you and just say, hey, can we talk about this? I'm just curious why you believe what you believe. I'm just curious why you do what you do. Why do you do church that way? Why do you do it that way? Brother Todd and I were just talking back there, and we were talking about the differences. You think that church is interesting in America. You should do church in Africa. You should do churches in other countries where they, they walk miles upon miles upon miles to come and worship, and they'll worship all day long. It doesn't matter if it's raining. Those countries don't deal with snow, so then, you know. But it doesn't matter. But I do remember a picture in Russia, I believe it was, if I'm not mistaken, it was a, a, a country with snow, all right? And we're in Florida, so, you know, I, I can recognize snow pretty quickly. <laughs> and so as I saw this picture, I saw these people coming together, and they weren't allowed to worship inside a building. It was during COVID. And so what they did is they were worshiping outside in the cold around the Word of God. And they were just worshiping. We got to do this thing together. Because let me tell you this. In many countries, they don't have the ability to have denominations. You see, what do you mean by that? Because it's so dangerous to be a Christian 
that they gather together, and they're not arguing about their differences. They're praying for the lost people in their in the places. They're they're talking through the word. They're praying over one another. They're they're encouraging one another, strengthening one another. But because we've been so much of a peaceful nation, we've experienced distance from war. This land has not seen war in quite some time. And because of that, we've become so complacent and so content that what happens is, is that we just look for things to argue about. Local churches and denominations must work together in order to be the most effective at spreading the good news of Jesus around the world. Let's read this. Verse 22. This is the reason why I have so often been hindered from coming to you. And so Paul's like, I've been wanting to come to you. I've been wanting to see you. Let me explain why. And the reason was, is because more people needed to hear about Jesus. And as I just read to you previously, he's ran out of places locally where they haven't heard about Jesus, which is a really good problem, right? And so he's like, I need to go to Spain, but I really want to see you. And that's what's been holding me up But verse 23. But now, say, but now. Do we serve the Lord's will or do we serve our own will? Our, our own will or the Lord's will? The Lord's will. And you say, why are you stressing this? Because he's wanting, he's like, all right, finally, I'm getting to go to Rome. But it says, but now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain, and to be helped on my journey there by you, once I have enjoyed your company for a while. He really, really, really wanted to go to Rome. And he wanted to encourage these local churches. He wanted to love on them and be loved on by them. And he wanted missionary support. He wanted to have time with them. But God had other plans. God had other plans. Point number five. Local <coughs> churches and denominations are at their strongest when they are praying for and serving one another rather than looking to tear one another down. Amen. Do you pray for the other local churches in this community? That is one of the things God really burdened me for. Because what had happened was, is I started sensing this real bitterness towards certain churches in our community, within our body. And that's not allowed. That's not okay. We should be praying for the other churches in this community. And praying for them even if they have some different beliefs and practices than we do. But we shouldn't just be praying for them. We should be serving together. How much more effective would we be? If we, as the body of Christ, came together and made a, a plan of how we're going to reach Gold County. Or let me even just get, let me get smaller. We have three churches in Highland View. You have New Beginnings, you have Highland View Baptist, and you have Highland View Church of God. What if we left our differences aside and we said we agree on the gospel of Jesus Christ and we came together and said, let's take Highland View for Jesus. Amen. Yes. Yeah. But it doesn't start with Highland View Church of God. And it doesn't start with new beginnings. It starts with you and it starts with me. Because what's happened is, is Satan has created boundaries, dividing lines. This is my church. That's your church. My church is better than your church. That is not of God. That is of Satan. Make no mistake about it. Now, may it also be very abundantly clear, when there are churches that are teaching that sins are not sins, when there are churches that are teaching that salvation is not what salvation is, that Jesus is not who he said he was, they are not churches, and we are to be very clear about that. Amen? Amen? But are we to do it in anger? And are we to do it in wrath? And are we to do it like, or are we to do it out of love for Jesus? Love for Jesus it is. Verse 25. At present. Remember, he just said, I really want to go see you, Rome. I really want to go see you. I finally, I've gotten done with this land. I really want to see you. But at present, however, I am going to Jerusalem, bringing aid to the saints. 
Not my will, but your will be done. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. For they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. You say, why do they owe it to them? Because what had happened was, is that Macedonia and Achaia were planted because of funds that were sent from Jerusalem to fund the missionary movement of Paul and Barnabas. And you say, well, what was going on? Why? The, the text doesn't tell us why Jerusalem was in need. There's, there's some suggestions and some thoughts, but in Jerusalem, even in today, Miss Linda's talked about it. Sister Linda, she's talked about being in Israel and being a Christian is not popular. It's dangerous. And in that day in Jerusalem, it was dangerous to be a Christian. You'd lose your job. You'd lose family. You'd lose a lot, but you would gain Christ. And so what had happened is, is that churches in other areas that were doing better, they would go and they would, even if they had disagreements on things. You think the Jews and the Gentiles agreed on everything? Acts 15 tells us they didn't. But what they did is they said, we're going to come, come together around Jesus. We're going to come together around Jesus. And so what had happened was, is, is Paul was concerned uh, it, because he was, he was concerned that Jerusalem, the church in Jerusalem, the, the churches in Jerusalem, that they might be a little prideful. He was concerned that, you know, I don't need money from you, those people. Because that's easy, like, we can do that, right? Like, you know, I don't want any of my money to go to that convention, to that denomination. I, I, I don't want, no, no, right? And we like to tell our money where it should go, don't we? Let me ask you, let me remind you of this. Whose money is your money? It's God's. It's God's. Whose church is this? It's Whose land is this? And when you step out on that parking lot, when you step out in that grass, when you step into your home, when you step outside of your home, when you step on the White House property, whose land is it? It's God's. It all belongs to God. And we are to steward it for the glory of God. And those people who are living on that land, who may not know that they are walking on God's land, they still need to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. And it will not happen as effectively as it should if we as the church are fighting with our brothers and sisters in Christ in our own denominations. Fighting with our own brothers and sisters in Christ in other denominations. Fighting instead of serving together. It goes on and it says, For the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual Blessings, they ought also to be of service to them in material blessings. When therefore I have completed this and have delivered to them what has been collected, I will leave for Spain by way of you. So here's what he says. When I'm done with this, I'm coming. Do you remember what happens? <laughs> God had other plans. God got Paul to Rome. But it was not the way that Paul was expecting to get to Rome. And you say, what do you mean by that, Pastor? Here's what I mean, very simply, is this. Is what happened is, is Paul was told, as he was on his way back to Jerusalem, by some prophets and some brothers and sisters in Christ who loved him, that said, you're going to get bound, and you're going to be arrested. And that's exactly what happened. And then he is being sent back to Rome, because they don't know what to do with him. And so they go to send him to Rome, and he gets shipwrecked. <coughs> But he gets in Rome, and as he gets in Rome, he, he is house arrested, and he's still sharing the gospel, and God is using it in mighty ways. But then not only that happens, church history tells us that eventually he was released, and he goes into Spain, and he preaches the gospel, and many people come to know Christ because Paul was willing to do it God's way instead of to do it his way. Paul was willing to work with different churches and different beliefs and practices because they were united around a person named Jesus, and so they were able to do things that way. And then what happened is, is he went into Spain and God used him mightily. And then 
as I mentioned to you, 10 years about after he wrote this letter, for some reason he's back in Rome and, and, and church history tells us he's beheaded by the Emperor Nero. Here's what's going to happen. I need you to really look at me in this because I've seen this happen in my own life now that I've switched sides. If you are going to make room to unite around other believers who disagree with us on certain things, but agree on Jesus and the gospel, you're going to have people in your life that are going to tell you you're compromising. You're a heretic. You're slipping. And I would strongly encourage you to point to Romans 14 and 15. Now, I told you, our foundational beliefs, we have a document. What is it called? The Baptist Faith and Message. Anything else? I can agree to disagree with you. Because the message of Jesus is too important to argue about all those other things. Amen? Let me share with you the final verses and close in our sermon. Verse 29, I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. Doesn't that sound beautiful? The fullness of the blessing of Christ. I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. You say, who are the saints? The brothers and sisters in Christ. So that by God's will, I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. There is a refreshing that comes when we come together instead of dividing. And it says, may the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Did you know that your God is the God of peace? And when you will experience the most peace in your walk with Jesus is when you are walking with Jesus. Make no mistake about it. So what do I want you to do with this message? Here's what I would like for you to do. Three things. Keep going, brother. Robert. I'm looking. Okay. I didn't know if you knew you could hear me. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you, brother. The first is this. Form a prayer partnership with a member of a different local church, committing to pray for each other's growth and for unity in each other's church family. You want to come together? Put your money where your mouth is. Put your feet and your hands into action. Number two, host or participate. I didn't come up with the word. I kind of was like kind of thinking about what is this called, and I looked it up, and this is apparently what they call it, a diversity dinner. I don't know. Come together where members from different local church backgrounds share a meal and stories of their faith journeys. Number three, Organize or join a community service project to serve alongside fellow believers at different local churches, reflecting the servant nature of God's church. Do you think that if we did these three things and we applied this message to our lives, that our church and that we would be much healthier as believers in Christ? I do. I do. And I think that the world would be different because of it. Now, as we move into our time of response, how can we respond? If you're a believer in Christ, many of these things that you'll see on the screen are ways that you could respond. Now, did I cover every one of them? No, but I covered the key ones that kind of tend to be the ones that normally come up. Because what normally comes up is that we like to, you know, we like to build some sin up in our lives, and so we need to repent of some unconfessed sin in our lives. We need to, uh, we need to not only do that, maybe sometimes we need to do it publicly. Did you know there's public confession of sin in the, in the Bible within the churches? And so there are sins that you've been holding on to and you've been trying to battle on your own. And you're just like, church, I need you to know. Forgive me. Or maybe it's already been public and you need to go and repent publicly. Uh, some of you, you need to seek some private accountability in your life. You need a brother or sister in Christ to help you in this walk. Some of you have never been baptized as a believer in Christ. Which means, according to the Bible, and according to Southern Baptist, I believe it is, is that you are walking in disobedience and you're missing out on the blessing of being obedient to the Lord in that. Some of you, you need to become a member of this church body. Some of you, you need to join a Sunday school group. You need to join a Bible study group. Some of you, 
you need to serve. You've got talents and gifts and passions that God has given you, and you need to serve inside this church because your church has a place for you. And then others of you need to serve outside the church because outside the church, there's a place where God has been calling you and you haven't been answering it. Some of you, it involves your marriage. Some of you, it involves your parenting. Some of it involves your work. Whatever it is that God is calling you to, what you are expected and commanded by God to do is simply respond to two words. Two words. Yes, Lord. There's never been a time in my life with Jesus that I've regretted saying those two words to God. And there will not be a time when you do so either. Amen? Amen. Amen. So what about those who don't know Christ? Well, as I shared with you a couple weeks ago, and as I share with you every Sunday, I need to tell you some bad news. The bad news is this, is that there is no way to God without Jesus. And so the bad news is, is that you are guilty. You are separated. You are born <coughs> separated from God because of your sin, because of your lies, because of your um, the way you look at men and women who are not your husband and wife, because of the lust in your heart, because of the, the desire of covetousness that you have, whatever it is, that has separated you from God. The worst news is, is that you can't do anything to cover that up. You can't go to church enough, you can't preach enough sermons, go to seminary long enough, you can't do anything enough to cover that sin. But the good news is, as I had mentioned already, that Jesus came and he paid the price so that you, because you can't, so that you don't have to. And the best news is, is that he offers it to you freely. And all you have to do is repent of your sins and place your faith <clears throat> on Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And if you make that decision, you'll never, ever be alone again. You will be Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word, your truth, your grace, and mercy. I just pray that this message has challenged and convicted and transformed my brothers and sisters in Christ in this room and those that are watching online. And I pray that you will receive all the glory from this message. In Jesus' name, all God's people say, Amen. Amen.